welcome to another episode of the Commander and Coffee podcast, where there's always something brewing. In today's episode, we uh, thought we'd have a special little brew for you. Today, we want to talk about tournament decks in CDH, uh, basically our top 10 lists that we would bring to any type of in-person uh, tournaments or events. Uh, with uh, 2022 coming to a close in 2023, right around the corner, there's a lot of sweet events coming up in the uh, next couple of months here for the competitive CDH space. Uh, companies like Eminence Gaming have really taken off and started with Pun City last year, with Silicon Dynasty uh, coming up this month as well as other online events that have started, uh, playing with Power starting their Mox Master series, as well as Chaos in the Nexus doing their uh, events there that they've done all through last year. So uh, with a plethora of interesting and fun tournaments, both online and in person, we wanted to kind of go through and look at what the uh, top 10 lists we would bring as individuals. Each one of us came up with our own list today, and neither one of us had influence on the other's list. So these are totally each of our own thoughts and opinions on the deck lists. And then once we kind of give our lists, we'll kind of compile and at the end kind of give the commander and coffee unified uh, list that we would recommend you bring to a turn. That. So with that being the case, let's, let's dive in. I'm, I'm really psyched to uh, get in and, and see what uh, degenerate lists you, you guys have for, for, for us, for commanders to bring to these events. Yeah, this is going to be exciting. I'm, I'm really excited for this one. And one one exciting thing, even beforehand, like I think it's really cool that we are already different without even listing decks and just the way that we decided to organize our lists. It's really cool, like because I feel like each of the three of us has a different play style and a different personality, and that's reflected in the way we decided to make a top ten. Uh, so yeah, we'll get into that as we go. Yeah. So getting into the lists, um, before we start really getting into commanders, um. One of the things we did was we didn't put any restrictions on it. We just said 10 commanders that we think we should we would bring to an event. Um, each one of us had a unique way to list it. I have mine broken down into two categories. I have what I consider to be the top four best decks in the format. I think the decks you should more than likely bring to an event. But then my five through 10 number here um, are, are kind of grouped all in the same category. Um, but I still think are viable. I still think are good, but I think are a little less powerful than the, than the the big four that I have, which you're all into. Uh, what about you, uh, Billy? What do you have going on with your list? So as you guys all know me, uh, I am a lot more fluid with lo- all my stuff. I tend to bounce around a lot more. So I kind of made my list on here are the 10 decks that I personally would take. Uh, I would correction. Let me say this. I would feel comfortable taking to an event. Um, and I think I would be able to perform well with uh, in no order whatsoever. Yeah, you, you do say that you love chaos so much, right? Absolutely. Chaos is absolutely my favorite thing. You just throw all 10 of them into a hat, pick one. Yeah, wheel of morality level shit. Just dartboard style, just nail it. That's what I'm doing. I mean, you guys have known that I've changed uh, commanders and added combos the night of because I had a dream about it. So what about you? Why? How did you uh, come across to your list? Yeah, it's actually funny. Um, I have the most traditional list. I have a definitive 1 through 10. And um, I think that kind of comes from the fact that I tend to value consistency a little bit more often than explosiveness. That's just my play style. So you'll find that there are little pockets of deck archetypes in my top 10 as we go. So, so basically, looking at all three of our, our takes and our variations... Uh... Why is going to get the most flamed because he's so definitive with it and rigid. Yeah, and I have the most unique picks on my list, which I definitely think are some of them are definitely more controversial. I'm a little more flexible in the fact that I have like, yeah, this section here is probably a little better than this section here. And then Billy's just like, I don't, I don't care. Pick one. So uh, bring 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 your bring your comments to for why in the chat and, and we'll be more than happy to, to field those. Um, but enough talking around. Let's get into the lists. So uh, I guess I'll start us off. So in my uh, big four, um, one of my big four decks, no stranger to the the Storm combo community fan that I am, Rograx Silas uh, Turbo Control. Probably one of my favorite decks uh, in the format. Um, if not, is my favorite deck of the format. Uh, I just think it's blazingly fast. You know, having a commander that comes down on zero and being able to turn on free interaction and just, you know, consistently try and present wins on the second uh on the second turn of the game third turn of the game as well as having some unique ways that can continue to grind with card advantage i was about to say the grixis uh core is your wheelhouse for sure i don't think it surprised any of us that that was in your top three 
No, and I think it's I think it's fair to say you're going to see a lot of Grixis from me, uh, Grixis core from me. I just think you know, uh, like as you see a lot of my lists, things like Underworld Breach, Dockside Extortionist, Rhystic Study, Mystic Remora, Demonic Tutor. Like th- these are all the cards you really want to be playing in these types of events. So uh, that's really how my my list folds. But yes, Rog Silas, uh, start, first pick of the draft for me. I also had Rogsai in my list in my top ten or my ten, I should say, not top ten, uh, because of all the points that Chris did point out. It it is one of the fastest decks in the format, if not the fastest. It's very consistent, and I love it. You know, it's a lot of fun. It's honestly, I, I've actually enjoyed playing against it almost as much as I enjoy playing it. Uh, one of the ones that I really enjoy playing uh, a lot is Najila Pivot. Um, or Najila Breach, sometimes you'll hear it called. Basically not running the stacks pieces or focusing on the Najila combos, uh, but actually using that Grixis shell like we're talking about and going for that turbo ad nauseum, but using Najila as a uh, a distraction method, like a red herring, so so to speak. I guess we're talking about, you know, Roger Silas. So on that topic, um, in my top 10 list, the fast, explosive, like traditional storm esque combo. It actually makes up the entire center mass of my top ten. But even within that, Roger Silas is at the top of that category. It takes the number four spot on my top ten. Um, I think that if you're trying to play fast combo, that dedicated Grixis core without any extra flair to it, I think that is. I would agree with Chris that I think that's the best like fast combo you can be on right now. So. Yeah, definitely a strong showing from the Roger Silas. That's the that is one of our unanimous votes. Did you say it was number four? For me, it is. Yeah. Boo! Boo! I this know. man. I know. It's, <laughs> Boo! This person. Yeah, I I do think. I don't know. Let's just like throw out statements and see how many of them are controversial today. I feel like for a player who's not familiar, playing a fast combo deck is a good way to just like throw games. Um, so like a thing, it's not something that I would take to a tournament without putting a lot of reps behind it. I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's fair to prescribe that to anyone else in general, but I mean, if someone were to come to me and say like, I don't, I have all these decks I can build. I don't know what to play. I probably wouldn't recommend Roger Silas unless they were familiar with that archetype already. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to go on and do any deep on, on Roger Silas, but I will say it is a very complicated deck to play and you, you do need to know what you're doing. I agree. The ceiling is stupid high. Um, I feel like the floor can be a bit lower than you would like if you don't have the reps. For like a storm specialist, I say thumbs up. I'd bump it up way higher if we're talking about like the best like fast. Yeah, now this we should preface this also so that uh, why it doesn't get all the hate. Uh, this I'll take is it. this okay. You could take all the hate. Uh, he's yeah, no, saying it, that this is the turn. definitive one. Um, this is the end all be all list. His top ten is the one to be the one. <laughs> I was going to say is this is for him, uh, basically for what he would play. This is what he feels is his top 10. Yeah. And like, this is, this is so difficult. We we would spend a whole episode just like talking about the, the situation in which the top 10 is made. I mean, it's the whole, like the superhero fight, right? Like Batman with prep time, you know, are we talking about like, if you're playing as a robot with perfect play style, what, who's your opponents, what kind of event? There's a million situations you can put these decks into that would change the top ten. So with that being said, let's let's move on to my next deck, surprise to no one, is Tim Necrom. Uh, Tim Necrom ah. being y- unanimously known throughout the community as, as, as a very powerful deck, um, and, and I truly think it is. Um, having that Grixis core and add, adding you know, some of the more busted cards in the format in, the, in, in Esper Sentinel and, and Ranger Captain of Eos and having the uh, ultimate um, way to prevent yourself from losing the game um, or being countered out of the game with your combo with silence and, and things like that um, re- really just make the deck very powerful. Um, Tim and Krom, powerful uh, card advantage engines if you do need to pivot into more of a grindier game plan, but still has that ability and that and that speed to be not, not as fast, but still able to, you know, do the Rixis core, you know, turbo into an, into an ad nauseum or quickly develop an underworld breach or thassa's oracle demonic consultation sometimes you need a you need a splash of milk with your grixis shell right make a little combo latte tim necrom is currently my deck of choice right now uh i have been having some great success with it and i love it because uh like chris said it does tend to slow the game down a lot 
um, only by like a turn or so. I, I tend to rank my uh, commanders on like when they're expected to be winning. Uh, and Tim Necrom is usually around turn three, turn four in my book. And I really like that because I also enjoy, again, I'm harkening back, the pivot strategies uh, like Najila, like Tim Necrom. Um, I just personally, the, the, I found that in when I was running my Najila list, I barely ran any green. And I'm like, well, if I don't need green, why don't I just play Tim Necrom? I, and honestly, I don't miss it. Um, you're going to find a lot of the decks that I have don't really contain green. I think this year has been very good to Krom in particular. Like out of all the partners, I think Krom has had the biggest glow up in 2022 because I think everyone's just realized how strong he is as a board position. And obviously like the, the card advantage engine that he is such an amazing plan B in a deck with so much pressure already. Can I make a hot take? It's my turn for a hot take. Do it. <laughs> I think green is the uh, objectively worst color right now in Commander. I, I don't think it has a lot going on for it comparative to what the other colors have. I can get behind that. If you go by our uh, combined 30 decks, green actually makes up the least amount of... Uh, it shows up the least. Com- it's actually tied with white. Uh, so, you know, everyone's been memeing on white is the worst color. I mean, I think white got a lot of really great cards recently. And Ranger as Captain. you can see that you're, it's good enough to splash in your Grixis combo. And yeah, I feel like comparatively green as a support color is about as far as you get um, with a lot of this. I don't see a lot of new green spice comparatively. Like honestly, so so two things here. Chris, uh, if you could run one white card in your ROG side list, what would it be? I want two. I know you want Silence and Ranger Captain. I want Esper Sentinel, and I want. Oh, okay. Captain. I need I need the captain to get my Esper Sentinel. Cause you're right. You're right. Uh, and I mean, honestly, the best card that uh, Green has really is, honestly, it's Veil of Summer. And that's really it. Like feels pretty sick. Endurance is good too. Don't forget about that. Yeah. So Veil of Summer. Uh, Anyways, I can't endure difference. this conversation anymore. Hey, this why? How about you? This is getting off topic. Let's 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 transition back. Uh, green sucks, but moving on. Um, why? What do you have on your list for? Uh, what's your next commander on your list? Do you want me to uh, line up with the Tim Macrom, or do you want me to go onto my own list? However you feel like you want to do it. This is open season. Oh, baby. that makes things difficult. You know what? Screw it. There's no way since we all have our own rules on making our top ten. We are we are doing our best to like. We're literally like cutting off the corners of jigsaw pieces to make them fit together. So. Here's my, here's my number 10. Here's my number 10. I'm just going to lay it out there. Um, my number 10 deck in, in CEDH right now is Kamal Timna. The reason being, I think it's just like... I, I think it's one of like the safest things you can bring to a random event. It has the staying power to kind of be a jack-of-all-trades. You have access to white to deny combo. And you have access to green to kind of get a lot of pieces online to have that finishing uh, haymaker with Kamal, you're going to have something meaningful to bring to a given pot. You mean like Abzan toolbox? Like an Abzan toolbox, Abzan stacks, like the win conless version, I think is pretty solid. And as we see a lot of fast combo on the top ends of our list, um, it stands to reason that in response to those decks being prevalent, that more stacks pieces can shine like a Thalia. So is this the 2015 meta? The pre-Flash Hulk meta? <laughs> you know, it, what's old is new again, right? I think that a lot of meta stuff goes in cycles um, in a lot of formats, and I think CDH is no exception. And as we see, you know, more accessibility to... I mean, now that the database is pretty much like a a known thing in every home, right? Uh, I think you'll see that once the strongest combo deck gets prevalent, you'll see a lot of people emulating that. And yeah, the the stronger the top decks get, kind of goes with it that the stronger the counterplay decks get as well. Do you find that with the recent issues on extraneous round times and delays and hiccups in tournaments for the, these win conless stacks decks that it's still a solid deck to bring to an event like this then? Because I know there's been a lot of changes and I know some tournament organizers are looking at new ways to to change, you know, end of round procedures to mm-hmm. help mitigate and speed up the tournaments. I think that is a really great point you make, Chris. 
I've actually put in some thought about that because, yeah, the... I mean, I think all these decks, you need some amount of familiarity. That's just a general rule of playing the format, of, of any format, is know, know the deck you're playing. That was a big issue in the era of Lantern Control in things like Modern. What, what it kind of ended up being was like it was more of a pilot issue of these rounds that were taking extra time. There were a lot of experienced pilots who could execute their very slow stacks finisher um, and you know mill them one card a turn with Codex Shredder and could do it efficiently. And I think the same is the case with Mal Timna and other win conless decks of that um, of that breed. I think that if you know what you're doing, if you're if you're thinking about your play pattern or turn cycle ahead, then you don't end up going to time because of anything of your fault. And I think like on the opposite side of things, I think there are people piloting fast combo decks that are going to time as well. So I, I kind of put that responsibility more on the pilot le- uh, more so than the the deck list. I really genuinely, honestly, I can't stress this enough, hate the word win con list because that straight up means that you are being disingenuous to the point of the entire game and you are actively trying to ruin the game for three other players that's fair that that's a colloquial term i agree with what you're saying the i mean the win con is you know kamal um an eventual thing yeah that that's a good that's a good clarification to make billy but here's the thing though so people see that and they see that on the deck list database and they see it as win con list stacks and they take that to heart and people will literally drag out the tournament um, one of the most recent tournaments went a total of, I believe, four hours over time, give or take. Jesus. Yes, uh, over the expected time because of people playing these win con lists events and also not activating properly. I mean, I, I was watching one of the, the events, at, at one of the streamed rounds and witnessed one of the people who was notorious for it uh, literally pick up a Thrasio Scry stare at it and then put it back down off to the side of the deck and then pick it back up like they just forgot about it and this is even before they decided to put on top or bottom or reveal it things like that and a round timer is so important time management skills is well it's a skill to have in real life and it's a skill to have in tournaments because i i personally you guys all know i'm the stacks person i love stacks you won't catch me playing a stacks deck anymore in uh, events because of the time management. We did uh, it, even... fam. We did it. <laughs> I know. And plus, I've also had the horrifying conclusion that I'm actually a control player and not a stacks player, but that's besides the point. Um, but even myself, I consider myself a very good stacks player and a very enfranchised stacks player and can play it efficiently. I'm not worried about me the other people don't know how to play around the stacks. Also, when you're playing stacks, people are just going to give free wins away. That's my rant on win con lists and stacks in general. I I am done now. I would go more into detail, but if you want to hear me and Billy's talk track on this, uh, check out the Eminence TV YouTube channel with us in it. And we, I go very deep into how I feel about round timers and stacks and all of that in, in the, uh, in that episode there with, with them. I had a feeling that the number 10 slot was going to cause this kind of rift. All the direct all of your comments, questions, and concerns and complaints to to why in the comments. Uh, moving on though, let's get back into the list here. We got a lot a lot of lists to go through still, so I'm putting Najila in my list. Uh, I, I think Najila is a very strong and powerful deck. Uh, I know there's a lot of variations to build the deck, but I think taking that core Grixis shell that I, that I talked about, using things like Underworld Breach, Ad Nauseum, and all of those powerful cards by being able to add in, you know, the absolutely insanely uh, busted green cards. Uh, the absolute most busted green card, in my opinion, Elvish Spirit Guide card is just a free Lotus Petal when you want it to be. Um, absolutely bonkers bananas cards that, that exist. And Najila being a card that makes Jeweled Lotus broken, as well as just being the win con in and of herself, uh, just really pushes that deck to. I, I think arguably, if I if I had to actually like gun to my head, legitimately pick a pick a best deck, I think Najeel is probably really high up on the list. You have all five colors. You have a, a cheap commander, win con in the command zone, all all that kind of thing. I just think there's a lot of complexity around that. Yeah, I, I mentioned it before. Najeel is on my list. It's uh, one of my favorite decks. It's actually one of the decks that I had a dream about playing when I was thinking about playing something else when I was going to Punt City. Uh, and like I said, I, I believe the Pivot Najila is the best version of Najila. 
um, being able to just jump around and and flip around from one win condition to another very easily is it's my play style and it works. It's great. I've always had some uh, some success. I also got a real sweet Druid's repository looking for it, but that's besides the point. I think we need to crowdfund and get you in a medically induced coma for like a good week or two. And you can just wake up and have a brand new meta for all of us. I mean, I need a good coma sleep. Like, that would be wonderful. Right? Just call it my barber. That way she can give me a good shave while I'm in my coma. And that'll be great. It's fine. When we uh, when we start doing the Mars travel, you know, if they can if they can induce hibernation and stuff like that, like they're trying out, that's how you do it. Yeah, so I'll be on my way to Mars, wake up in what does it take, like four years, give or take, and I'll call up Chris, Chris and you and be like, hey, so what about this deck? Hold on, let's do it this way. All you would have to do is update the last four years of card releases, and then you're good. You have the core figured out. Exactly. So enough about Mars travel and stuff like that, because I could go on for days, uh, maybe even years. What about you, Y? All right. Number nine, Yuriko. I think this needed to be somewhere in the top 10, and the nine slot felt right to me. I think it got an, an absurd number of upgrades you know, from Kamigawa and things of that nature. It also is a deck that plays my personal Holy Trinity, being uh, Null Rod, Cursed Totem, and Grafter's Cage. I think that's just a sweet thing when you can be rocking all three in your deck especially when there's so many decks that get absolutely shut down by any one of them in play. It has a lot of pressure, and it is going to be a very good thing against an ad nos list in your pod, which, through random opponents, it probably is going to help you significantly. Yeah, I, I feel very strongly about the deck. I feel that it's also an easy deck to... At least I feel like it's a deck with a high floor, here I thought I was a stacks player. Hold on. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's been like a, I don't know, like some weird solstice, like zodiac shift. I don't know, but like, well, there's Mercury in my Gatorade, so you know. You've been going more to fast combo. I think I've been going more to stacks, and uh, Chris is the rock that holds us all up. But, so, so all I'm hearing is is why we need to spend more. You need to spend more time talking with me over deck, so I can convert you to the light. See, that's my New Year's resolution is I'm going to play more fast combo. How about that? I'm going to show you the folks. wonders. I'm going to show you the wonders of Underworld Breach. I'll completely change your outlook on, on, on Commander. Can you guys role play as Aladdin and Jasmine? He can show you the world. No, I mean, um, debatable. Which one? Am, which one am I? <laughs> I want to be the carpet. Getting this back in line. Uh, I think Yuriko is actually interesting. I don't. I, I would probably wouldn't have it in my top 10, but I do agree that I think it's a it's a fantastic like you're getting into CDH beginner deck. You get to play a bunch of cards that you probably liked from EDH in, in, in your Eurico deck because it's a mix of tiny weenie evasive creatures and enter the infinite. That's the card enter the infinite and doing doing shenanigans like that. So um, it's definitely interesting. I think it's a little I think the card quality for me is what really, really holds me back. Having to play Mem Knights and some other clunky cards in order to kind of make something work, I think kind of kind of holds it back. Uh, I'm also an advocate, as you'll as you'll hear through my lists, that I like more colors. Um, uh, so I tend to try and I have I have a couple two color decks on here, but I tend to shy away from those. Um, from there, then, so yeah, interesting pick. What's next on yours, there, Chris? I went all the way up to. Uh, I started with Grixis, and then I added added in white, and then I added in green to get all the way with Najila. Now I'm going to put on my. I'm I'm trying to help our listeners, and I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to talk about my last deck in my top four. Um, and I, I really hate this deck. It hurts me. I don't like it. Uh, but it is uh, Winota. I, I think Winota is a very strong deck. Uh, it's had a ton of success across the circuit. Uh, in most events, it's usually doing deep runs if it's not outright winning big events. It's the best aggro deck. I don't necessarily consider it a stacks deck. It has those elements that make me cringe, um, but it, it is a very powerful deck, and I would be remiss if I didn't do the listeners justice and add it into the the top four best decks Um in the format having the velocity of just being able to attack and put put powerful creatures into play like rick and the the one that gives double strike and thalia and play historian. historian i don't i don't i die to these cards i don't i don't care what they what they're called 
I do want to go on record that I hate this deck, uh, and I will probably never play it. But if you sh- if you do like that style of archetype, you should probably play this deck. It's a really good deck. My my turn to get some hate. Uh, I also have Winota on here, uh, and I think it is a very brainless deck. You just kind of like attack and do the thing, and doesn't require much thought, in my opinion. Um, and but it is such a strong deck, and this this kind of falls under the Yuriko camp too, where it's a um a good learning deck. It's a good intro deck, uh, and it definitely goes through and helps everything out with with like learning because it's, it's a cheaper deck too and it has a lot of variants and stuff like that uh i prefer the kiki combo version i do know some people like the more avalanche style um but yeah no i i it's a deck that i had together so i could be- better explain it and every time i played it i was super bored so uh how about you why uh i just i just wanted to add like i think my only pushback on on your take is that I think a lot of the skill of playing that deck is front loaded. It's a lot of your setup and your mulligans and your first like two turns is developing a board state that takes advantage of hitting your commander. And then after that, I mostly agree. Um, yeah. Number. Oh God. How do we count backwards? Um, eight. Eight, eight, eight comes after nine. Or this is rough. Nine. I don't have them numbered on my paper and I don't know how to count without numbers. Number eight slot, I've got Thrasios, Vile Smasher, Curious Control. I lack self-confidence. I put all the decks that I play near the bottom of this top ten. It's rough. I'm confident in myself that I can play them, but, like, I don't know. You would think that I'd put my main decks at the top and be, like, biased and stuff, but I, I just, uh, I guess I'm too realistic for that or whatever. Bro, I put Winota on my list. I'm, I'm never touching that deck with a ten-foot pole, so... That's fair, I guess. Okay, cool. It's yeah, good to know I'm not completely alone. I also don't see Silvala on here, but that's besides the point. Oh no, so I would never I would never ask anyone else to play green white Silvala. That's a that's a death wish. Um Yeah. I don't I don't even know if that makes top twenty in my opinion. Like that it's just a weird one that for some reason I have success with, but like I think it's some kind of magic like like Ash's Pikachu. I think I'm the only one who can like have success with that deck, honestly. So I actually have Thrasios File Smasher on my list as well, uh, but I did not do the, I have a different version. Yes, I, yeah. I do like the Grixis wow, this shell. Is all spoilers. <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> um. So yeah, Thrasios File Smasher, Curious Control, just another deck that I think just has a very high floor to it. Like the the amount of time I've piloted this deck, you're always doing something. The only question is how much, um, which is a really positive review in my opinion. And that actually rounds out these these bottom three decks are the ones I felt were the the quote unquote safe ones, the consistent ones with Curious Control, Yuriko and Kamal Timna. Those make up those three for me. Looking at my next pick, Kark Sakashima, um, I think the deck is very powerful. I think there's a lot of luck that has to play into it. You have to be able to win coin flips, but I think there's a very skill um, pattern to it. Um, I'd be remiss to not put this deck on. It's as it won what was classified last year as the CEDH World Championships Tier 1 Con. And its pilot ended up winning the entire event. So I, I think not having it on there is a little bit of a crime. I think the deck is very good when it goes off. I think there's a lot of hate around the deck, um, which which is understandable, because um, it is a complicated deck to play. I don't recommend going in kind of bar none, like don't pick it up the night before and decide you're going to do very well with it, because it's going to be a very challenging deck. But I think if you're an expert pilot for the deck list and, and kind of know what's going on in, in the game, that it's, it's it's a good deck and can do you well. I also have uh, Krok Sakashima on my list as well. Uh, for a lot of those reasons, it's very, very versatile. It's also very resilient because there's so many cards that kind of layer into each other as they go. <clears throat> uh, that really makes it well worth running it. But like Chris did say, it does spout a lot of hate. Uh because of you know reasons uh people are very vocal about the hatred towards that deck and uh apparently quote unquote that's the deck that causes a lot of slow play issues uh but honestly i think stacks is a bigger contributor to those slow play issues uh and also just genuine genuine not knowing how to play i'll call it as i seize it but again chris is right a, a an experienced pilot can navigate through their storm turns or their their turns their, their flips a lot quicker than 
honestly, some people could fetch a land. Why thoughts? Because I think I saw you had this on your list too. Yeah, it lines up. Good job, everyone. Um, it makes up the number seven slot. I mean, it's still top ten, right? But uh, there are three combo decks above it, which I kind of classify as fast combo. The one thing that I think holds it back is the lack of black having access to your, you know, demonic tutor, your thoracal combo. Um, I think that kind of can get in the way, but I think it's like you can't deny that it's so explosive and more resilient than people can give it credit for until they actually play against it. Uh, I think that that's a deck that's here to stay. It was a weird breakout oddball for for a while, and I I actually I'll I'll you know I'll fully admit I was wrong. Um, I thought it was going to be a flash in the pan that people would have you know would learn to play against it, and then once the unknown factor wore off I, fa- I thought that it was going to kind of fall out of the meta so to still see it around is really cool and i think that says a lot because when you get a weird deck that sticks around i mean it really makes you think that you found something definitive at that point and i think you're you're not really going to see another deck that does the exact same thing what i like a lot is that your luck based deck in quark sakashima is your number seven for lucky number seven dang all right. It's interesting to me that you consider Kark Sakashima a, a turbo deck per se. I don't necessarily know if I classify it as that. I think it's a good deck. I think it's a storm, a storm based combo deck. But I, I don't know if I would put it in the turbo category. I, I get it. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would call it like necessarily turbo. But it, it's like I feel like it's trying to do like combo plan A at least. I don't know. Not just interesting. Uh, I guess I'm up next. So in my. Uh, number in my in my next slot pick here uh, i'm finally doing it uh team if you haven't noticed a trend i'm, I'm moving away from red temporarily uh we're, we're gonna we're gonna move off of off of the uh the mountain color base and we'll be uh, back i'm sure oh yeah we'll 100 percent be back uh let's talk about though my my next pick is tivit um i think tivit is a very interesting deck uh, i think it's one of the one of the more um prominent esper decks you can you can possibly play um, in today's day and age, it is a it is a very vast difference from what I'm usually advocating with these low to the ground um, commanders in, in a six mana commander. Um, but he kind of rules the skies. He is he is, in my opinion, the best control deck. Uh, it did, in fact, win an event last year. Uh, it went on an undefeated record, I believe, um, in that particular event. So um, it, it is a very strong. It's a very powerful deck. It has it has win con in the command zone with one single card plus the commander. Um, can still do this the standard turbo ad nauseum things. Granted, you're lacking red for the explosiveness, but still can kind of play this control game and and kind of just can take over the game in ways that I don't think a lot of the 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 CDH decks are built to kind of deal with. So, I've been playing Tivit for a hot minute, uh, and all the things that you said, Chris, are true. Uh, but my biggest thing with it is it's missing red, and it hurts that it's missing red every time i'm playing it i'm wishing i had some type of uh, effect like a dock side because a dock side would make it so much better for me um but one of my de- decks that i have on here which does include red is malcolm tana um or just malcolm plus glint horn you know uh, i think the creature strategy is very underutilized as of right now and malcolm tana takes advantage of it uh i also get my red that i was so craving and while i was running tivit so chris you're putting tivit on a pedestal as the as the esper deck right on behalf of the people as you know as a representative um i have to ask uh what made you choose tivit on this list and not i don't know i think i think zur is a good example like why not zur as the esper definitive good deck um what what gives tivit that new home because, I mean, Tivit's a new deck, right? What makes you so confident that it kind of has the crown of best Esper deck? So I think there's a couple of, of key principles. Um, obviously, Zer is super powerful. We know you cast Zer, you attack with Zer, you get next potent game. Um, the, the problem is, is Zer's in a weird place. Um, he, gets, he gets checked by a lot of things. He's, he's very upfront in what he does. Not saying that Tivit isn't, because everybody knows you, you play Tivit in Time Steve. The problem is, is a... Six six for six with flying and ward two or I think it's ward, ward three ward three is just like unkillable and it, it checks crumbs very well right crumbs are not attacking into a tivet um, when it comes into play it gets you value right it, it guarantees you two treasures 
So at worst, it's really four mana roughly for, for, for a Tivit. I mean, you have to spend six up front, but you get two back. And then it also gives you card draw and clues as well. Um, and then you can do some weird things with those clues. I think in just the way Tivit kind of comes in and just kind of dominates the game. I mean, it's also a 6-6 six, six flyer. So in a games where you're playing a board stall where like something like a, like a Thrasios has like a seed board muse and they're pretty happy with themselves. Like I have a 6-6 six, six flyer. Like you're, 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 you are on a clock. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a pretty fair uh, takeaway from that is like Tivit isn't necessarily the most exciting thing in a vacuum, but in the context of the meta, it's checking a lot of really specific boxes, right? Like you're you're comparing it to like, you know, on the board versus a Krom and the value you get out of the tokens. It's just like specific to Tivit. You have Tivit in play against like a Timna Kamal stack stack, right? Like all I need mm-hmm. to do is cast one single artifact and I win the game, right? Like it's over. So and if even if I don't get that particular off, I'm now threatening a six six in the air. Like it's 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 just powerful. It, it beats up on stacks. It beats up on the turbo decks with its controlling elements. I just think it and it, it kind of dominates the mid range plan. So overall, I just think the deck's very strong. This is an awkward follow up to just talking about this, but like my uh, my number six is a Chrom deck. It's a Timnacrom Blue Farm. It it just needs to be on the list. I think. I mean. I think part of that is the strength of the deck, but like another part of that is actually coming from the popularity behind it. I think there's just been like this renaissance of the uh, of those Grixis shells, and like I think Timnacrom is such a huge part of that recently. Anytime a deck has that kind of collective community focus, people are going to innovate more, and because of that, I feel like this is the deck that it has the most attention given to it. So I think it's going to be able to you know, if it has any faults at this point, I think it's going to be able to, like, be the first deck that gets updated, be the first, like, definitively optimized thing on the database, because so many people have eyes on it. So, um, a lot of confidence with Timnacrom, and I think that's kind of, for for whatever reason, you know, for our own reasons, we all have it on our list. I also think two things on that. I also think, one, for as far as that's concerned, I think there's a lot of give and take. I think a lot of people have a lot of hard pressed opinions on certain things and, and we need to come together and understand that sometimes they're pet cards and they're not good. Um, but that's a topic for another day. But uh, I, on the other side, yeah, I think Tim Necrom is just objectively just a really strong deck. I mean, you, you get to play like, whereas Najila is something that gets to play all five colors and plays all of the best cards, but has worse mana. Cause you have to try and figure out how to, how to convey all five colors. You, you still get to play about, 98 percent of the best cards in timnacrom and you have way better mana so like it's just it's just objectively it's just a very powerful deck being able to kind of just just do whatever it wants to do and i think it has some of the most showings and most consistent win percentages i think from the year 2022 as far as cdh events are concerned i I, i'm i'm fairly confident on that i don't have the numbers in front of me but i do believe it is one of those types of deck so you just went over the ways that tivit kind of checks a lot of the things that Krom is doing but even with that being the case, if I'm playing Tim Necrom and someone at my table is playing Tivit, I'm not exactly sweating bullets over it, right? Like, even though it, it counters me in some ways, I still feel confident playing Krom. Yeah, very good deck. No hard counters, really. Looking at my next pick, I have to come back to, to my dock side. Um, I want to specifically talk about a deck that I think absolutely breaks the card, Dockside Extortionist, if it's uh, not already uh, broken enough as it is. So uh, this deck is Korvald, and I think uh, it, it's a very strong deck. It's in Jund, so uh, it's this is my first foray besides Winona into non-blue. Um, but I, I think it it has a lot of power to it. You know, again, it's a it's an expensive commander at five. I think it is. I'm pretty sure it's five. Um, but being able to just generate extreme value off of Dockside, put together really fast wins. It does basically its best impression of the Grixis core. I do think losing blue is kind of tougher in a tournament setting because blue gives you some form of, of control um, in, the, in the sense that you can kind of react with counter spells and things. But um, Corvold is still a very strong deck if you wanted to take something like that into an event. Of note, though, not Food Chain. Do not play the Food Chain version. Food Chain is a terrible card. You should not play in an event. Um, so if you're looking at the Corvold list, just play the ones that don't play Food Chain. Going with the, the Tiffer conversation, this is another uh, Crom conversation, or a uh, would you like to say it, Billy? It stops Crom bat. Yeah, I was I was gonna say a Crom conversation. Oh, I like that Crom conversation. Yeah, would you? Here you can. 
your turn. They, we're we're gonna have to crawl vold that over. <laughs> Good. Okay. So I hate my life. Now that we've said our fun words, I think this is another example of a deck that you resolve your commander and you no longer care about combat. You you were winning combat from that point on in the game. Uh, so you know, as far as like shutting down everyone's plan Bs in that pod, you kind of have that aspect of the game fairly locked up from the get go. I agree. I, that's a couple of the reasons that I actually put Corvold on my list as well. Uh, I, I think it's probably one of the fastest non-blue decks in the format and also has the most legs with everything and just keeps getting new tools that make it more interesting every set pretty much. And and I do agree with Chris, even though I was a food chain believer for the longest time, but just like food chain, I was turned to the uh, quote unquote dark side of the turbo side. And I think the treasure treasure storm variant is actually the definitive best version of Corvold and food chain sucks. I love how this episode is just, is just Billy saying that I'm right. And I can now have this on tape forever. And until the end of time. It's right. <laughs> no. Because you hate my puns. That's I why do. you'll never be truly right. I don't even know how to respond to that. Holy shit. What one? Brain. The fucking puns thing. Jesus Christ. <laughs> fucking broke my brain. <laughs> this makes <any> sense. <laughs> <laughs> Crom on over and tell us about yours there, why? That that sounded dirty and racist. I don't think we should use that one. <laughs> I don't know how it's racist, but all right, I don't whatever. know, man. I'm just covering my bases. I'm actually very surprised, seeing as though we had a whole lengthy discussion. I was the least invested in this deck, and I'm the only one with it on my top 10. So I'm really excited to hear about that. On my number 5 slot, I've got Roger Tavish. In in terms of fast combo, I think one of the things that can kind of get in your way is people messing with your color base and punishing you for being too greedy on your colors. And I think playing Black Red, Turbo Storm, um, Nauseam based deck, having basic Swamp in your deck, um, I think that gives you a really good angle to shoot. And I think Tevesh is a fantastic plan B that we discussed in the previous episode. I mean, we have nothing but praises to sing about how good Tevesh is on a board state. Um, even if you're just making two tokens and threatening an ultimate, it's such a great place to be. And it's something that really has no business being in your dedicated fast combo deck. But the fact that you more or less get it for free in this list is a really good icing on the cake. I have to ask the question. Did the Commander and Coffee episode where I deep dive the deck have any influence on this? Well, of course. I mean, it put it into my head. In you know, the same way I hope it put it into other people's heads. Um, it really got me thinking about it. I mean, I haven't piloted the deck myself. I haven't built the deck myself. But it's always something that's like on the fringe of me wanting to just sleeve up and play sometime. Um, I think if if the meta is ever like screaming to me, you need to learn fast. It's time to learn fast combo. Build something that that tries to threaten a turn two. Then uh, you know, Roger Tevesh, It's really high on my list of something that I'll probably give into at some point. Well, here's your sign because it's time to learn fast combo, sir. Yeah, that, do it. That- that being the case, there is one thing that I that you said that was interesting that I sort of disagree on. Um, to have a quick little sidebar on this one is I, I think more colors is genuinely better. I think you can. I think mana bases are very easy to get to play. I know we talked a lot about this in our mana base episode. Go check out both of those episodes. Um, but uh, I hashtag shameless like, self promotion. <laughs> now you ruined it. You made it worse. But uh, I was going to say, come on. Like, oh. Having more colors genuinely makes it easier. I don't think mana is that challenging if you build your mana base correctly. So I'm I'm a big fan of adding adding some extra colors. Yeah. There. Um, I do like though. I will say, as a person that hates stacks, I really like the uh, Roger Tevish um, Turbo stacks Turbo game. Tax Turbo Tax Turbo, turbo Tax Turbo tr- Turbo No Zero Game Actions Turbo Trinosphere, whatever you want to call it, deck that's been kind of popping up lately. Um, you just like Dark Ritual into a Trinosphere on turn one, and you like sup sup bros. Uh, I think that's a really funny deck and a really cool deck. I don't know if I'd recommend it for an event, but uh, more, more power to you if you want to bring it in. Um, but I think that's a really fun deck to uh, to play. So to uh, to any of our people that might play Legacy, it's it's a variant on the uh, the uh, like Rune prison Stompy. decks of Legacy, the prison Stompy decks. 
uh, basically you want to power out your chalices, your trinospheres, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then just get a value piece on the board like Tevish and win from there. Yeah, that's that's an excellent reference on a deck that, you know, plays fast mana as well as the cards that hose fast mana. You want to talk about win conless decks? Uh, the, the deck wins by casting Tevish, ulting it, and then beating your opponents down with their own commanders. And there's definitely two different variants. There's the more turbo that's based around the um, Underworld Breach lines in that. And there's also the ones that are more focused on actually like a polymorph build with polymorphing your Roger into Sire of Insanity and or uh, Void Winnower to actually just completely lock out the game and make everybody's life miserable. Yeah, very interesting take. I I was genuinely surprised to see you... um... Uh, why you have Rock Tevish there. So very, very, very cool to see that deck. Yeah, awesome you, you made me a believer. If you're ever having doubts on uh, your influence, there you go. This episode is my favorite episode. I'm just getting told left and right that I'm correct. I love it. Um, speaking of being correct, moving on to my next pick. Malcolm plus either uh, Tana the Blood Sower or Vile Smasher of the Fears. Basically what I'm looking at is Malcolm Glinthorn. I, I probably wouldn't go two color. Um, but you want to play your favorite flavor of Malcolm Glithorn. You can either take the Core Grixis shell um, with Malcolm Vile, or you can go into the Teamer route with Malcolm Tana and having the like Eldritch Evolution Neoform Creature Toolbox package tutors. It does well in tournaments. It's 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 not a really fast deck that can do a lot of stuff. It's not a. It just plays well into into open environments. I feel like having access to just. Malcolm into uh, uh, Glinthorn win the game kind of thing on top of all the other things you can be doing in those colors um, is pretty powerful there. So um, yeah, it's it's why it made my list. I think it's strong. I think it's solid, and I think we'll see more of it uh, in the giving terms. Another one of those decks that I think is pretty low tier, easy for for people to pilot. I don't think it's as easy as like a Yurko because you have a little more colors. But as you kind of go through there, it's a really easy deck to kind of evolve into the next set for. for EDH decks. Not that it's, I think it's easy to play, um, but I think it's 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 easier to pick up and then master. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. I spoke a little bit about that when I was talking about my uh, Malcolm Tana being on my list as well, but uh, I, I'm going to Armix it up, and I'm throwing Armix and Krom on there. It's the Core Grixis shell. It is probably a full turn slower than Roger Silas, uh, but what it loses in that turn off it gains in having a way to remove these creature uh strategies from the board in our mix and also we talked a lot about how crom is a great pivot card because you could slow it down a little bit easier but you still have that core grixis shell that's going to really carry everything i think the moral of this entire episode if you're going to take anything out of this um more than chris wants to toot his own horn uh it's actually just play grixis yeah, I was going to say that. I was trying to get in there. You you got it. Play Grixis. Yeah. Play Grixis. Uh, it's really the most it, winningest. I, I I don't want to say the best because obviously the best is subjective, but the most winningest and most consistent uh, shell in all of the current tournaments. I mean, uh, I have played in probably the most events out of the three of us right now. Uh, and usually the top tables involve at least one to maybe two uh, decks on average having some type of Grixis shell per pod. Here's the thing. Right now they just have the best cards, right? Dockside Extortionist is a completely busted card. Underworld Breach is a completely busted card. Ad Nauseam is a completely busted card. Ristic Study is Mystic Grimora are completely busted cards. So demonic tutor, vampiric tutor, they're they're completely busted cards. So it's just it's just all of the best cards. It's it's literally Thassa's Oracle. The, Thassa's Oracle, demonic consultation. It's just literally playing the the best cards you can possibly play in the right. It's it's so lean, it's so consistent, it's so powerful that it really is like uh, I can, facetious all we want, joking all we want. Play Grixis, Grixis is the best colors. Yada yada yada. It just it's just playing all the best cards playing the best of the best of the best cards in the format. So that's why you see a lot of Grixis in the decks. But speaking on non-Grixis decks, I think why you're up next with a non-Grixis deck in your number three spot. My number three is a unique pick from the group. Um, I remembered our boy Kinnan Bonder Prodigy. I think that this deck is stupid explosive. I think it gets under a million decks in the format. 
um, in, in what it specifically is doing. And the, I don't know, it's a big question mark on what version they're on until they start going off. At which point, um, if you guessed wrong, then you are in pain, right? Because if you're if you're playing around a fast combo and they flip into like a void winner, then like what do you do at that point? All the all the preemptive actions that you've done until that point kind of get thrown out the window, and vice versa, right? If you're planning on trying to go for a fast win and and getting ahead of their big creatures, and they just like turbo monolith you, then that's kind of the end of the conversation. I think Kinnan represents a very diverse pair of decks that it's hard to pin down what version they're on and it's so, it can be so explosive that if you give it any shred of leeway if the table goes shields down for a turn cycle the game can be over and i think kinnon capitalizes on that opportunity better than a lot of other decks out there are we talking about big kinnon um like we see tyler from play to win play a lot uh, that that is like that is the one version, yeah, with the with the big creature, the big boys. Mid-power. Okay, because that that's I just wanted to make sure because that's actually the, the when when I saw Kinnan on your list, that's what I was hoping you were gonna say because I do feel that that is the de facto objectively correct best version of Kinnan, um, as opposed to whatever the other one was. I can't even remember. Um, but you know, I I do feel like that is the better Kinnan, and, and I do like Kinnan a lot. I, I I think it's a neat shell. I kind of have them and there's a pair. I think like the not knowing what version they're on is part of why it's a good deck because your core is so similar, right, with your mana dorks and then your payoff, you know, you don't know what their payoff is until they start going for it. Hot hot take for me. No, I'm not taking questions at this time. Hit me up on, on Twitter if you want to talk more about this. I genuinely think mana dorks are bad. I I'd actively just think mana dorks are the wrong play and you shouldn't be playing them. Um, but that being said, I think Kinnan is the closest chance to leverage the ability of those dorks to be somewhat useful. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting deck. I do think the mid power deck is pretty powerful being like, you just get seven mana and then all of a sudden, like there's a void when we're in play and you're like, well, crap. <laughs> what do <laughs> you look at Thrasios as like the, the go-to mana sink, right? But like the ceiling of Kinnan's mana sink ability is higher than Thrasios. And if you think about it, it's effectively the same mana cost because of Kinnan's, you know, preemptive mana doubling effect. So yeah, I, I think that um I think Kinnan can hang in there. Even though Thrasios has access to two more colors, um I think Kinnan is super solid. And I actually did I rank a Thrasios deck above Kinnan? No, I rank Kinnan above the Thrasios deck. It just punches you in just such a specific way. It's not a tempo deck. It's not a tempo deck the way Yuriko is. It's just like mana tempo. You're just ramping so stupidly fast that you risk getting to the finish line before people are done setting up. I think it's interesting. I, I do, in some ways, have a Kinnan list on my end. So my next pick um, is uh, is another four-color deck because I did do love colors. It's uh, Thrasios Bruce Tarl, so Sans Black. Um, more specifically, I think there's a lot of variations on this deck. There's like the... The the Evo the Evolution versions the Pod decks Blue Pod stuff like that. I'm talking specifically the Dawn Waker variant. Um, I think that deck has a, a very strong deck. I think it has a lot of staying power. I, I think it it has a lot of. Uh, I'm not a big fan of multiple layered win conditions in a deck, but I think that for some reason the way that this deck layers those win conditions and how frequently they pieces either overlap or the piece is just genuinely a decent piece kind of fits in this weird shell that works i don't understand personally because i think like i said layered combos are pretty bad it's just a bunch of clunk but for some reason i feel like this deck is very strong in what it does it, it's very powerful if you know what you're doing it 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 it, it does you right i mean it, it also had some tournament wins and i think it placed second at okotoberfest or in the top it was in the final pot of okotoberfest so yeah final pot. um very, very strong deck, very very powerful in what it does, being able to set up kin infinite combos with Thrasios to draw your deck, being able to use the Devoted Druid combos, this, that, and everything else. The way it just layers, it's just, it's just incredible to me. So I think it's a very great deck to pilot. I really like Thrasios Bruce because that is the toolbox deck that I like a lot. I think that is the toolbox deck that is a toolbox deck more than whatever win con list stacks we were talking about earlier that I've completely erased from my brain. Um, 
but I've had the worst luck with Don Waker and it kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. Uh, my Thrasios deck of choice. Well, I have two of them, but I'm going to go with this one first uh, is Thrasios Timna. Uh, and I went with the Razakets build Razakats build uh, involving Leon and Re- Relic Warder and Animate Dead and looping that way along with, you know, Razaketh. Duh. Uh, <laughs> so like the reanimator strategy running Herman Druid doing that whole thing. So that's the one I like the most out of Thrasios Timna. Uh, unfortunately, Flash Hulk is no longer a thing. Uh, and it ain't coming back anytime soon or at all. So it might be the year that not the year, but it's kind of time to get off the rest Timna personally, but I still think it's very strong. Also sacred Druid is garbage. Why thoughts, opinions, semi angry threats. I don't know. Like yeah, I don't said anything I super disagree with. I mean, yeah, I think like the year of the, the Thrasios and Timna lists are, I don't know, I think they've kind of worn out their welcome, especially with Red being so good right now. So I think that's all, really all it comes down to, right? Like, you're you're omitting arguably the best color to be on right now. It's just like, you're you're almost going out of your way to make yourself upset. Yeah, it's, it, Thrasios Timna is, is not where it once was. I still think it's probably a decent deck, but yeah, it's it's just not, it's not, it's no longer in the days of Flash um, be, being as strong as it was, but um I mean, it still it still plays good cards. It just it red is so stinking strong right now. The category of like always good, never great kind of thing to me. Yeah, I mean, honestly, every time I've played the deck, I have taken a lot of game actions and never won. Yeah, I can see that being the case with like Kamal Timna, right? Um, I thought it was interesting enough to talk about, but like, I don't know. The 10 slot is so debatable, um, like the lower tiers of our top 10. I think a lot of things can fall out of favor from that top 10 if new stuff comes to light. I mean, I can't believe I forgot about Corvold too. Like, I don't know. It wasn't, I mean, it hasn't been in the forefront of, I think, a lot of people's minds for a while now. So maybe that's just evidence that we need that kind of reminder that, wow, Jenda's really good still, as long as Dockside continues to be a card, right? Absolutely. All right. Well, why you're up with your penultimate number? Yeah, it's it's a short one. Uh, number two slot, Winota. We talked about it. Um, I rank it pretty high. I mean, if you're playing something non-blue, I think you would be very hard pressed to find a better option. Uh, the stack is a beating. I think everyone should know by the, by now. Like, if you're in the format, like you know what it does. You probably aren't happy about it. <laughs> I think the point kind of got made earlier by you two. What's funny with Winona is it definitely started out as a deck that you looked at and you went, oh, you're playing Boros, I'm not even going to respect it. And now it's at the table and you're like, okay, well, I'm looking for uh, for a removal spell. I need, I need to stop this. That's one of the most threatening things that I can see on the table right now. Well, looking at our final slots, my final uh, pick for my, my draft of my top 10 is I also have a Thrasios Timna variant on there. Uh, but mine's straight, straight Hermit Druid. Um, I know there's a lot of talk, and there's probably people smarter than I that are brewing more in the space of Thrasios Timna, but I think just straight Hermit Druid is the way to go. I know people have been talking about Sacred Guide. I don't think that's a good card. I think you should be playing the Sacred Guide version. I think, um, you know, things like like Protean Hulk have had their day, and I don't think they're that viable anymore. I think they're good enough, but I don't know if I would want to bring that style of strategy to a tournament. Whereas having just Classic good old turn two Hermit Druid. If you people don't have a response, I win the game is sort of where I would want to be at with Theos deck and then being able to just find other compact combos like setting up maybe Yogwill line or stuff like that in order to to assemble my win. I think that if you're on Sacred Guide, then you are a hero of the people. I don't care if it's objectively correct or not. I want your autograph. Keep doing the Lord's work. I don't understand why you would play Sacred Guide when you can play Ranger, Captain of Eos, and Esper Sentinel. Those cards are way more cracked than Sacred Guide. Yeah, it was cute for a hot minute. And I mean a hot minute. Yeah, it's just like, it, it suffers from like the fact that White finally got good cards, right? Like, before you could run Sacred Guide because like, oh, what do, what do you have to cut? Like, Angel's Grace and Silence, and now there's more than two good White cards in the format. So now it's an actual decision you have to make. Not that we have one in the pipeline, but if we were to like a top 10 cards in CDH right now, I think Ranger Captain is like probably top three for me. Like the card is I'm the card inclined is to agree cracked. with that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those ones that I could definitely actually get a factual top 10, uh, like one through 10. Yeah, like a literal top 10. 
literally the only downside I can think of on Ranger Captain is the fact that it has double white in the cost. So, like, it's kind of hard to, I don't know, it can be kind of hard to resolve on curve in a four color or five color deck. And other than that, like, jam it every time. Tutors a dry engine, and then it's silence on a stick for when you need it to be. Like, it's just so good. Like, people can't win the game with Ranger Captains in play. Like, it's it's powerful. So, anyways, yeah, that's that's my list. Um, and that's what I'm sticking with. Uh, Billy, your final pick. My final one of my ten uh, is actually a Vile Smasher Thrasios deck. Uh, I go with the Turbo Grixis variant because the Grixis shell is just so powerful um that it's just it's it makes you mildly insane if you're not running it and and i genuinely don't like the card curiosity i think it's too slow and the curious control variant is is i i I just genuinely don't like it i i don't you're doing something wildly different yeah it's 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 like you're not even casting a vile smasher in your deck are you if i mean you're casting vile smasher because it's a great timna blocker uh, I guess, two, I mean, like, but I mean, like, functionally for your plan A, right? You're playing a Thrasios deck, and you just need black, red as your colors. Yeah, I, I'm just looking to generate infinite mana. That's really what I'm genuinely looking to do. I'm not looking to slow the game down. If I want to play, play a control deck, I'm playing uh, Timna and Krom, if we're being honest. No, I think that's solid. I think that is solid. I mean, I, I've i played the most curious control here, I think. Um, I'm biased. I can't even say much. I, I know I'm biased. Do you have anything more to say on yours, Billy? No, that's all. All right. Number one slot, Najila. Cool. I put all the controversy in the bottom five. Ooh, Najila and Winota are good. Wow, wacky. Um, but yeah, um, I'll kind of say about Najila, some of the things I said about Kinnan is that one of the strengths, one of the many strengths of Najila is that you kind of look at your three opponents and you're like, knowledge check, you do your turn one and turn two, and it's like, what version am I playing? If you don't know it, then you are now disadvantaged, right? Like there are so many versions of Najila that all that all slap. And it's like if you're looking to jam tournaments, part of that study guide that you need includes like what are the unique cards in all of the Najila variants? Because all of them can kill you. And all of them are resilient in their own ways. And if you don't know if they're trying to you know, be offense or defense on like turn two, that turn two to turn four area, you get got. You just have so much pressure just with the text on the card. And, you know, we mentioned all the ways that it has such advantages over other five color commanders, not to mention the format as a whole. Yeah, I think it's very telling. I think Najila is just a just an insanely powerful commander. I mean, she makes Jeweled Lotus broken, which turns on all of your free counter spells, or free interactive pieces. And, um, Fierce Guardianship, Deflecting Squad, and stuff like that. She's got her own, you know, creature win the game card off of things like Derevi, Grim Hireling, Gem and Repository. She can still do the Ad Nauseum Underworld Breach thing. She's in all five colors. Just uh, overall a, a powerful commander. You know, you're, you're going the turbo strategy. You play turbo, and then when the board gets stacked out, you just switch to Najila Beats and go off from there. Yeah. It's like against Najila, you can't allow her to have fast combo you can't allow her to you can't slow the game too much so that they build up a board state with creatures either and you also can't let them just untap every turn with rainbow mana because then the activated ability gets you at some point it's like no matter what the pace of the game is Najila has a way to beat you yeah i think that's actually why i kind of feel that i agree with chris <laughs> moral of the entire episode yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i'm choking on my words because it hurts so bad i personally also rank najila probably if you again put a gun to my head i'd probably say najila was the best deck in the format don't tempt me do it try <laughs> me i've watched those youtube videos on how to defend myself yeah most of them are run otherwise uh, i think you're getting scammed yeah <laughs> no i could do the thing where i'm in the car and i lean back real fast Except my car has uh, or like the fast and furious ejector seat. Yeah, exactly. There you go. All right, guys. Well, that was <laughs> so. Anyway, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, that was an interesting take. Um, hopefully, people learned a lot. Um, looking at our list now with the list in order, anything we we didn't talk about interesting that you wanted to ask your ask uh, one of our fellow co-hosts questions as to why why a certain deck was in the list or 
Anything like that before we move on to uh, our unified list? The wacky unique ones are Billy's Armix and Crom, Chris's Tivit list, and my inclusion of like Kamal Timna and maybe like the Kinnan inclusion. I think those are the ones we did talk about though, but like those are like the standout ones in my opinion. So I, I guess my question, right? Would any of us consider adopting anything from someone else's list, right? Now that we're thinking collectively, is there anything that we would adopt from someone else's list? Immediately, right? I think Corvold belongs in my top 10 somewhere. I mean, um, definitely over Tim Nick Mall. There you go. Okay. So, like, if we were to use that as an example, you know, after listening to your, your background and why you chose it, I think I could see Corvold being in my top 10. Um, yeah, possibly over Kamal Timna, possibly over like Yuriko. I don't know. Um, something near the bottom, I'm sure. I completely agree with that. I'm willing to adopt that point of reference. Uh, I'd actually probably, if anything, swap my Thrasios Timna Razaket's variant out for Tivit if we're speaking like that, um, mainly because it, it does block Crombat, and that is very important. So, yeah, I, I'd literally rather forego green because green's bad. Um, to drop down to Esper and go from there. Um, in before Chris says that his list is absolutely perfect and, and nobody should hate him. You're, you're allowed to admit no wrongdoing. That's, that's a, yeah. <laughs> wow. Wait, wait, you call me out like that, bro. Um, no, I, I'll say this was a topic that I was really passionate about doing with the group. I I've done extensive thoughts on, on this and I, and I do think that my list is, where I would want to be for a tournament. I'm not saying it's correct for everybody, but I, I do think that my list is probably where where I would end up right now. I mean, obviously the list will evolve as new cards come out and new 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 findings and discoveries happen. That's that's the fun of it. But I think that that's um, where I would end with my list. Uh, I guess if I had to point shade or do anything, um, I would probably work to continue to teach why the ways and get that Tim to come all list off of his list. I just, I think stacks is terrible. <laughs> Chris is going for the full, like civ cultural victory here, right? You're not budging an inch. That's fine. I don't, I don't mind some good cultural exchange though. Ne- next year we're all going to rank rock side. Number one. I mean, honestly, like it, if anything, one that should be removed from yours, Chris, would probably be Thrasios Timna, because I just, I really don't think that color combination is good right now. Like, I'd put a, a Armix Krom up there before that. You know, just losing red is just so detrimental right now. Here's and, the thing, like, what are we actually worried about, right? Is it losing red or losing Dockside? Like, if Dockside, hypothetically, is, I'm not exactly rooting for it one way or the other, but, like, if Dockside gets banned, how much does that obliterate our top 10 list? Uh, out of my list personally, one deck. Nice. Maybe two. Maybe two. Uh, it's definitely Corvold, and I mean, Dockside's kind of important to Gila, but like not the most. And, and for for everybody out there, I uh, I hate to put timetables on things, but we've all been working on this entire thing, like these lists, for about a little over a month. Um, we've all been working on trying to get them together to. Uh, what we have now and I mean it, it is and we've all been working independently um, so it's it's not like we're being like Sharon well what about this what about that and uh, it, what's really funny is about three days ago before we recorded this um, you know we were both all approached by each other said okay who's going to culminate the list in one area and nobody saw each other's list for this entire month and we all shared them, and we shared so many similarities in a lot of places, and yeah. then so much uniqueness. Tim Nicol, Um <laughs> This is our really, secret Santa. Yeah, this, this is basically our version of Secret Santa to each other. Billy copied my homework. Yeah, apparently copied the homework, but like, so we're apparently linked mentally. Uh, it's like that twin thing, except we're not twins. Uh, <laughs> nope, you just copied my homework. It's okay. Yeah, yep, I, I peeked <laughs> over your your... Uh, shoulder while you were so many miles away from me and I copied it. Yep. That's exactly it. Like I said, before we get into the final list, these are our definitive lists. These aren't necessarily um, right for you. These are just our recommendations as to what you should take into an event to do, to do uh, have the best shot at winning in our opinion. Yeah. And I, I'm actually going to put a call out to our listeners here. Uh, no, if no, you... no, I'll be confident. I say, these are the, these are the decks you should take to a tournament. I'm going to say it. I'm going to impose my opinion. Because I believe in, I believe in us. As long as it's not Tim to come off. Fair. Well, you know, I'll knock it out for Corval. There we go. We can revise. 
Um, Look at that. I already did it, boys. We've done it. <laughs> Who said bullying doesn't work? <laughs> Take that out. Take that out. <laughs> But no, I'm going to I'm going to put a call out to our listeners here. Uh what's your 10 decks that you would take to a tournament? If you had to, you know, pick 10 separate decks and bring them to a tournament, what would they be? Uh you saw ours, what about yours? Uh and tweet at us uh cmdr_coffee. underscore coffee. I mean, all our links are in the show notes and everything like that, so you know how to get a hold of us. Yeah, we'll make it nice and clickable. It'll be great. All right, guys, so with that, here we go. Here's the ultimate commander in coffee top list of decks to play in an event <laughs> to play and vibe with what's the acronym for that cctd commander coffee tournament decks yeah Ooh, i like that actually yeah so i guess our cctd list as you would uh we have in no particular order these are just the, the decks that had the highest showing uh rogzai tim nekrom najila and winona and Quark sakashima all came in with a clean sweep for all three of us. So uh, those would, would be kind of the, the big five, I guess you would call it, as to what we all kind of unilaterally agreed upon. And then um, if the change did happen, though, I want to point out, Corval does move yeah, in. Yeah, put Corval in there. Corval now moves into six. So those are the and six decks. It's great. Yeah, it's great because we were going to fight over the 10th the, the slot, and now we don't have to. Now it's like we cleanly have something that like, like three or two of us have agreed on. You're probably going to want to delete that because you're wrong because Corbold was already in the 10 because it had two votes. Oh no, we stopped the fight. Yep. This sucks. And then that is followed by Thrasios Timna. Again, we have one Hermit Druid, one kind of Razakats version. Um, we have Malcolm Tana. Um, the Malcolm decks are very powerful. And then Vile Smasher Thrasios, one Turbo, one Curious Control. Kind of round out that midsection of commanders that we brought. Um, and that kind of brings us to about nine commanders. And then the 10th one would be kind of those discussion points that we had, the Tivits, the Armix Krom, the Kinnon, the Rog Tevish, the Yuriko, and Tim Nicole's no longer there, so we can remove that. Good job, team. Um, I, I want to I fight for Kinnon in the number 10 slot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a good word. If your name is Tyler from Play to Win, then absolutely, because he is the only person that I've ever seen do well with that deck. All right, this one's for you, Tyler. By executive order, I'm putting Kinnon in the, uh, the 10 slot. That is a good stopping point. That is another episode for us here today. Um, so again, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Remember, all links uh, will be in the show notes below. Uh, we did put together a uh, little bit of a, of a bookmark page on Moxfield there that'll show kind of preliminary um, lists with primers from the authors that have kind of championed these decks and kind of brought them into the DDB light. So be sure to go ahead and check that out there so you can kind of see those and give those um, people that spend their time on that a, a, a like and a follow as well on their Moxfield pages. Um, but uh, while you're out over on Moxfield and, and out and about, be sure to uh, follow us on all of our social platforms. So for this, another exciting episode of Commander and Coffee, I'm Cypher, a.k.a. Chris. I'm Cork, a.k.a. Billy. My name is Y. We had a busy day. We were drowning in data and charts today. So there never was any coffee today. There was, there was no coffee. We're out of coffee either way. We're done. I never got my coffee. Keep on brewing, everybody. Peace. <laughs>